God, as we turn to your word this morning, I pray that you would help us, give us focus, give us attention and clarity as we come to your word. We thank you, Lord, that you spread your good news throughout your word. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And you give us such wonderful details about your gift of Jesus on that first when Christmas came, and Lord, we thank you, we thank you. We turn our word, hearts and our attention to your word this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about Christmas confidence. Last week, we talked about the spirit of Christmas. And remember, I hope this past week, you have been putting into practice what we talked about. The spirit of Christmas is not really warm, fuzzy feelings. It's not, oh, it's all about family, it's all about love, it's all about giving. It is all of those things in part because God loved and gave his son, his family, to us. And so that's on his part, it's love on our part. The spirit of Christmas is one of thanksgiving and gratitude. Along those lines, we want to let you know that when the new year starts, beginning with January 1st, we have, uh, we're in the midst of preparing, we'll have it by next Sunday, um, a daily gratitude booklet for you that you'll be able to write something each day as a thanksgiving and a gratitude for the Lord. Uh, we want to start, I don't want to jump over Christmas yet, but we, we want to start the new year in the right way and in a good way. We'll talk with you more about that, but Lord willing, we'll have the booklets ready by next week to give to you so you can get ready for the new year. And we'll start off the new year in, with grateful hearts and thankfulness unto our Lord who has done all things for us. But today we turn again uh, to the word of the Lord, and when I want to talk about Christmas confidence. I sort of struggled with, well, Lord, what shall I call it? How shall I call it? Some of you may have a better phrasing for it. For me, this was just the way that I, I, I put it. And you may look at that and you may think, well, that sounds like kind of a modern, a contemporary take on what are you going to talk about? Um, this is the best way that I can put it. But we're going to look at the Christmas story again that you know so very well. And we're going to look at it sort of from a contemporary perspective, but we're going to look at what it tells us about God, how he worked at that time in bringing things together, how he communicated with people. And it's going to, as we look at the Christmas story, we're going to find out things. We're going to see the evidence of the nature and the character of God that should give us confidence for our lives even today. So we're going to look at some of these things. These are scriptures that most of them, I think you'll know every one of them very well, except one or two in the Old Testament, and you're going to wonder, why is that there? But you're going to see why as we look at this. And so as we look at the Christmas story again from the, the prophecies all the way through, we're going to see the evidence of the character and the nature of God, the wonderful character and the wonderful nature of God that will bring confidence to our lives as well. I want to look first, we're going to look at a few passages first that, that give us one of the themes that shows throughout the Christmas story, and you're going to see it again and again. We're going to look first at Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. This is actually where, when I was preparing this week and as I was praying, a, a lot of times, I, I promise you I don't go to a book and find sermons and say, hey, I'm going to preach that at Lighthouse. That, that's not the way I do it. Um, but as I start praying and preparing, sometimes the Lord will give me just a verse or, or just an idea or just a thought, and then through prayer and preparation, uh, it grows and it builds. And so actually, this is where it started, this message started. So I want us to start with this. And this is all the way back, and it's from the prophet Isaiah. And we talked about this last week. So this tells us, do you remember, last, do you remember how many years ago? Uh, before the, sorry, how many years before the birth of Christ? I asked it in the wrong way. Isaiah wrote how many years? About how many? About 700 to 730. We don't know exactly, so I'll just make it really rough. About 700 years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah writes, and from the Old Testament prophets, he has the most to say and the most prophecies about the coming Messiah and about the birth of Jesus, as we're going to see this morning. Um, and he writes in, pro in prophecy, prophetically, listen, it's the voice of someone calling, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord, make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys, level the mountains and hills, straighten the curves, smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. 
Years, 700 or so years later, when John the Baptist was preparing the way for the Lord, the Pharisees sent some messengers to him, and they were jealous and they were suspicious. Who are you? Who sent you? Why have you come? And at that time, John the Baptist said this. As the, as the prophet Isaiah said, I'm a voice calling in the wilderness. This is part of the Christmas story. It's the preparation for the way of the Lord. He prepared people's hearts. And here's a physical example of what you do to make a straight highway. Bring down those mountains. Raise those valleys. That's what we would do physically to make a way that's easy. To straighten out the roads. Um, but he was doing it spiritually in the hearts of people. He came to do, came to prepare the way for the Messiah. Messiah. And so John the Baptist says, I am, as Isaiah says, I'm the voice that's calling in the wilderness. But what I want us to, to, to focus on is that last verse, verse 5, because there is part of one of the themes that we see in the, in the story of Christmas as we go through it. Look at it, what it says. It says, after we do these things, says, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. All people will see it together. Now, these four words, the Lord has spoken. And here we have with us one of the themes of the Christmas story that is woven throughout the Bible. And I, I encourage you with it this morning that you might find confidence in your God. The story of Christmas as it is inspired and then as it was written down in his word. We see these things that are just improbable. We see these things that take thousands of years to come to pass. We see things happen that how can it be because the circumstances are impossible circumstances. And we see as we go through it the answer. How can it be? In what manner? In what way? The Lord has spoken. And there's a theme for you this morning, brothers and sisters, as we look at this. We're going to look at several more passages. As we look at the Christmas story, these things that happen, how? Because the Lord has spoken. How will it come to pass? How can it be? The Lord has spoken. The declaration of the Lord and its coming to pass of what is declared is a thread that runs through the Christmas story from beginning to end. So this is about 700 years before the birth of Christ. Now, uh, Sorry, before the birth of Christ and the birth of John the Baptist. They were only about six months apart in age. Then let's move forward 700 years to the time of the birth of John the Baptist and then the birth of Christ, uh, or just before that time. And I want us, keeping this as a theme, let's look at Zechariah. Who is Zechariah? The father to be, okay? The father of John the Baptist. And so we come to Zechariah as Zechariah is in the temple performing his duty and he meets face to face with an angel sent from God. And the angel of the Lord brings an improbable message to him. Let's look ver first at verse 13 and 14. And we see here the message of the angel. First of all, don't be afraid. We always think, oh, well, if an angel appeared to me, I wouldn't be afraid. I'd be, I'd be, you'd probably be afraid too. <laughs> um, that's one of the most common uh, responses that we see uh, in the word of God. It, it's a, it's a, a fear or, or, or terror. What, what is this? And so Zechariah obviously is afraid. And here is the message. We're going to come back to this later as well. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son. Name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Now, this is great news, but I want to ask you, how is this to be believed? It seems almost impossible because, as Zechariah says to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now. And my wife is also well along in years. And so the circumstances are not easy. Uh, I shared in the first service, you know, I had a birthday recently. And I personally think I'm still young. Um, one of the kids, one of the Nepali kids, had written a really nice birthday card. He said such nice things to me about, oh, when I first met you, oh, there's something about you. You're so special. And so I was getting the big hit. I thought, you know, and then he goes along a little bit further in the card and he says, but now you're very old. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> trust a child to always tell the unfiltered truth, right? <laughs> and so, I, but personally, I think, I, I, I think I'm only middle-aged, which means, of course, I'm going to live well beyond 100. Um, and, and most of us feel that way as well. But the Bible says that Zechariah and Elizabeth, and Zechariah himself says, uh, I, I'm an old man, and my wife is also well along in years. And if you go back to look at verse 7, which we're not going to look at this morning, in fact, the Bible says uh, that they were very old. So there's one strike against them already. Uh, the angel gives this good news, and but they're very old. They're Physically, they're really pat, that's what it means. They're really past the age of, of, of childbearing. But there's something else if you go back and read the story earlier. And what you read is this. Elizabeth was barren. So she was unable to have children. So it's several strikes. He is old, she is old, and she's barren as well, has, and has always been barren. And so it's three strikes against them. How can this happen, this wonderful news, this good, this promise that comes from God? And it is not surprising that Zechariah says, but how can this be? Now, before we judge Zechariah too harshly and too quickly, may I say something this morning about us? You and I also have the promises of God at times, don't we? The Holy Spirit speaks to our heart. There are things in His Word that we read, and, and the Holy Spirit prompts us, this is for you. This is about your life. This is about your situation. It's not just, oh, I'm going to go grab something, but the Holy Spirit really speaks to us. However, what we do instead is we look at our circumstances, and that's what seems more real to us than the promise of God. Is, is that not true? Uh, that's what I struggle with at times, and we look at that, and we really struggle with, how can it be? And here's something for us this morning. That's why I called it the Christmas confidence. We, we're like Zechariah. We, we, we really are. We want to believe, but how can it be? Because circumstances speak to us so strongly otherwise. I want us to go a little bit further, and then uh, the angel says uh, to him, and I can imagine him Probably not, because you know he's an angel. But I can imagine the angel being a little bit offended. Now, this is my, this is my interpretation, okay? It's nowhere in the Bible. But doesn't it sound like it just a little bit? Then the angel said, I'm Gabriel. You can kind of see him doing this, can't you? I'm Gabriel, one of the three great archangels. So there's the Gabriel, and Gabriel is the, is the angel that we see most often associated with all of the events surrounding the birth of Christ. Then there is Michael as well, the other, the other great archangel, the warring angel on behalf of God's people and on behalf of Israel. And then I, I believe that the other great archangel was Lucifer, the, the one who led the worship, but he fell. And so we have Gabriel and we have Michael, but Lucifer fell and he became Satan. And, and that, that's why great was his fall. That's, does the Bible say that clearly? There are things that you could look at. Anyhow, that's an aside. So here's Gabriel. And Gabriel says, I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. We get all excited about angels. And God sends angels. God uses angels. They are glorious, miraculous beings. And there are, there are stories of, of even today when God sends his angels in specific circumstances. And I'm not talking woo or, or things like that. God, still, God is still God. God still has angels. God can do what he wants to do. But I think sometimes people get a little more excited about the angels than they do about God, don't they? Gabriel's point is, I stand in the presence of God, and this is his message. He points to God, and that's what we must do. That's really the miraculous part of this story. But what I want us to see is this. He comes to the end of that, and look at what Gabriel says. He says, I, this is, I'm in the presence of God. This was his message. He sent me to bring you the good news, for my words will, will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. It will happen not because an angel has appeared, not because Gabriel has said it, but because God has sent him with this message. It's God's message. And to me, one of the confidences of Christmas, when I look at how God stressed again and again, God spoke, God spoke, God will make it happen. 
He will make it happen. And if God has spoken to you, I just want to make an application here. If God has been dealing with you and you know it's God about something in your life and he's been speaking about this, you hold on to God. Get your eyes off circumstances. How can it be? Get your eyes off this and that, and instead you look to God. God is the one who brings about the fulfillment of his word, his plan, and his promises in our lives. Always. Amen. Amen. And so Gabriel confirms, my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Now, let's look at another group of people. Same theme again. Let's look at the shepherds, okay, as we heard uh, this, uh, this, this morning with the song. And we look at Luke 2, this whole passage. I'm not going to read all of it, but uh, I think there's a parallel between the uh, passage with Zechariah and the passage with the shepherds. I do, anyhow. An angel appears. They're all terrified. Zechariah was terrified. Shepherds were terrified as well. The, the Bible does not tell us it was uh, Gabriel. I kind of think it's Gabriel to me, but the Bible doesn't tell us that, so we don't know. We'll find out when we get to heaven. And the angel says the same thing to them that he says initially to Zechariah, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. And in essence, that's what the angel Gabriel said to Zechariah as well. I have good news for you. This is not bad news. This is good news. And he gives them the sign. Uh, the, the Savior has, sorry, first of all, he gives them the good news. The Savior has been born in Bethlehem. And then he gives them the sign. This is how you will recognize him. This is how you'll find him. He'll be in a manger wrapped in, clo in, in cloths, tightly wrapped in cloths. And so we look at verse 15. Here's the difference between Zechariah and the, and the shepherds. And I think to me it's quite interesting. You know, I think a lot of times we're a little bit more like Zechariah than the shepherds. Um, God has given us the wonderful brains that we have and sometimes, and we should use our brains to study and to learn all we can about the Word of God. But oh, let us always have obedient hearts to respond to the Lord in faith and belief when He speaks to us. Not to, how can it be and is it this or is it that? Because though Zechariah questions, the, the shepherds who are, li are likely uneducated, certainly much, much less educated than Zechariah, who was a priest, the shepherds immediately say, basically, yay, let's go to Bethlehem. Really, yay, let's go. They believe it. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And there's that theme. The Lord told us about it. It has happened. The two go together. And then they find, of course, they find Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Look at the last verse. They were praising God. It was just as the angel had told them. Just as the angel had told them. And here's this theme again. When God says it, it will be, brothers and sisters. Then and now as well. He said, this is what you will find this, and that is what they found. Let's look at one more example. Let's look at Simeon. We talked a little bit about Simeon last week. Remember, Simeon was, I think he's a really old man in the temple. I think he's much older than I am. Um, and let's look at the next, here we go, uh, next slide, Luke 2, 25 through 32. This tells us about him. I'm not going to read it all. You can read for yourself or make notes if you want to uh, for later. But we see Simeon who was righteous. He was waiting. What does it say? He was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. Now, I want to say something. Pause right there as, you, as we look at that. Simeon was not the only one who was waiting for the Messiah to come. Much of Israel, many Israelites, were waiting for the Messiah to come. I guess my question is, what's the difference between Simeon and a lot of these other people that really were, wait, that were waiting for the Messiah to come? What's the difference between Simeon and all of those scribes and Pharisees who had read the Word? They had the Old Testament prophecies. They had read Isaiah. They had read, they had read Micah, and they knew that a ruler would come from Bethlehem. They knew all of those things. But the angel didn't appear to them. And Jesus didn't appear to them. What makes Simeon different from all of these others who know that one day the Messiah come? Here's the difference. Look at what it says. The Holy Spirit was upon him. He was eagerly waiting for the Messiah. And he had, the Holy Spirit had revealed to him, you're not going to die until you see the Lord's Messiah. Now, when I read that and then I read the rest of that, so go ahead and read it. Here's what I think. I think Simeon was not a young man. Do you think he was a young man? No. 
I don't think he was a young man either because the oh, you're not going to die until and then what does he say at the end when he sees Jesus when he sees the Messiah now let your servant die in peace as you promised what that says to me is Simeon was elderly Simeon had waited it seems the implication is from this passage he had waited for much of his life for God to fulfill the promise that had been spoken to his heart. Here he was an old man and he had never given up expecting and looking for the fulfillment of God's word and God's promise to him. When I read that, it is a rebuke to me at times. How many times has God spoken to us or we've seen marvelous things in God's word, but, is it, but it hasn't happened and time passes. And after a while, we just kind of give up, don't we? We don't, say, we don't say, God, I don't believe you, but we just don't give it any attention anymore, do we? It goes on a back burner because we think, well, maybe, you know, sometime, maybe. The beautiful picture we see here is of an elderly man who has never given up believing, God, you're going to do it. I'm going to stay alive until. I'm going to be alive until. However old that is, I'm going to be alive until. And I think that's the picture that we see here. Here's someone who believed in the character and the nature of God, that God would make happen what he said would happen. And if God does it, then he does not change. His character is still the same. He does it today as well. He's still the same God. And so he says, now let your servant die in peace as you've promised. I've seen your salvation, which you've prepared for all people. And so for me, this is a Christmas confidence. We look at the next slide. Here's a Christmas confidence. God kept his word regardless of time regardless of circumstances. He kept his word. That's the type of God he is. He shows us that throughout the story of the first Christmas. He is still that way today. Has God spoken something to you this morning? Something that you have been praying about? A prayer that you believe God has birthed in your heart and it has not yet come to pass. Circumstances have not yet changed. It has not yet been fulfilled. Lift your eyes above the circumstances to the God who has given you his promise and his word. He is the God who changes not. Let this be your confidence this morning. And then let's look at the next part. Here's one of the confidences, but there's some other ones as well. And I love this one. This one is brief, but I, 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 love, I love this one. You know, he's God, and God can speak any way he wants to, right? Throughout the Christmas story, throughout that first Christmas story, God could have just said, I am God, this is the birth of my son, and everybody believe him, here he is. And he, says, he could easily have done that, but God didn't do that. And I want us to look at three, again, at three things very, very quickly. To the shepherds, whose lives centered around livestock and sheep. So here's another part of the character of God, a, a way that he works, the way that he works as we see in the Christmas story. To the shepherds who took care of sheep and livestock and every day fed their flocks and almost every day put hay and grass in a manger for the animals that were under their care. How did God announce to them that Jesus had come and was born? You tell me. The angel appears. They sing. This is good news of great joy. Unto you is born this day a Savior. Christ the Lord is in the city of Bethlehem. And this will be a sign to you. What's the sign? The baby will be born in a manger. To shepherds, he said, here's your sign. The baby's in a manger. He didn't say that to Zechariah. What did he say to Zechariah? To an old priest who had longed for a child all his life. But they were childless. He spoke to the hopes and the dreams in his heart. 
Let's click. The shepherds found the Messiah in a manger. Next one. Old Zechariah found hope and joy in a miracle baby. He spoke to his heart, didn't he? That's what he wanted. And then to the wise men who were likely extremely well educated, who were likely astronomers in some way. They may have come from China. That's what some people believe because astronomy was a well-developed science uh, in, the, in the world even then at that time. Or it may have been from the Iran, Iraq area. That's what some people believe. We don't really know. We'll find out. But to people who studied the stars and studied the heavens, what did God say? What did God give? A star. And when they come looking for him, what do they say? Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. And I don't know about you, but that brings me such encouragement and such confidence. He didn't tell those wise men, you're going to find him in a manger. He didn't tell Zechariah, okay, go look in a manger somewhere. He didn't tell Zechariah, go up and look at the stars. He spoke to their hearts. He spoke what was nearest and dearest to them. And I think God still speaks that way today. What are you part of? What, what are the things that interest you? How has God made you? May I challenge you this morning to look for God in those areas, to hear his voice and to see his hand in those areas that he has made of interest to you. My sister loves to garden. She loves flowers. And she sees the handiwork of God in the flowers. And she learns all about She says, now look, now this one, this, 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 and this. And I enjoy them, but as you all know, I'm not such a great gardener. I still enjoy it, but I don't, I'm not inspired in the same way that, that she is. That's how God has made her. That's how God has made her. And God sp can speak through that as she sees his beauty. God speaks to us. And to me, uh, next, next slide, God, the Christmas confidence is that God spoke their languages. He spoke their languages, and he still does it today. He is a God who communicates. He's a God who speaks. He's not quiet. He's not silent. He speaks. Then He spoke then, and he speaks now. Let's go a little bit further, and I want us to look at another one, and uh, the, the next passage, and here's what I want us to look at now. So first of all, so we see that he speaks their language. We see that it happens because it's God's word, and he's the one that makes it happen. And then here's another Christmas confidence for us this morning. Look at this. And you, we get into another part here. We go back to the story of Zechariah. And here you read a little bit more about him. And you're going to say, why have you included this part? This is not the exciting part of this story. Okay? Look at this. Uh, there's, no angel, there's no angel in this part. There's no miraculous happening there. There's no sign there. But this is part of the Christmas story because here's Zechariah and I want us to see some things again about the character of God as we see it in the Christmas story and then what it says to our lives as well. This event seems uninteresting, non-miraculous, and actually rather pedestrian and boring. There doesn't seem to be anything remarkable. How many of you just meditate on these verses, just these verses, and you get really blessed by them? No one. It's just about Zechariah, and it's about kind of Jewish history, and it's something about he's in the temple. But as we look at some details, we're going to see the miraculous before an angel ever shows up. Because at any one time, in the temple and around the temple, there may have been a thousand or more priests on duty at any one time, according to how they were organized. So it would have been around a thousand. So take a look at that. But this one happens to be Zechariah at, the, at this moment, at this time, in his lifetime, when he's old, at this place, 
while he's giving incense, while he's burning incense to the Lord, and while he's offering the prayers of the people, and while the people are waiting outside. And it says, for his order was on duty that week. And they served sometimes, the orders would serve some, sometimes two, sometimes three, time, three weeks in a whole year. They would cycle through. And I won't go into all the details of how the priests were arranged, but it had all been arranged. Nothing was random. Nothing was chance. It was all organized. There was nobody like, okay, well, I'll do that. Yeah, let me volunteer for this part. Well, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do this instead. It wasn't done that way. Everything was ordered. Everything was organized. And out of those 1,100 approximately priests, only one would be selected to take the incense in and put it on the altar of incense and to pray. And because, and, and how was it chosen? It was chosen by Lot, which sounds pretty random to me. It sounds pretty by chance to me. It's like rolling dice and say, okay, well, let's see. Is it number six? If it's number six, then it's you. But of course, it would have been more than number six because there are over a thousand priests chosen by Lot. And out of all of that, Zechariah is chosen. And he's chosen to do that because of the number of priests. A priest in this type of service would only once in his lifetime ever have the opportunity to serve in the temple in this way. And it's Zechariah at that moment and at that time. But it gets even more miraculous because now we go back to the Old Testament to a passage that I'm sure you haven't paid attention to before. And it's all the way back in First Chronicles. And let's look at this. And it's about David. And it's about David as he prepares for the temple and as he prepares the priests. And look at what it says. The King David, he gives Solomon all of the, the instructions concerning the work of what? The various divisions of priests and Levites in the temple of the Lord. Now, look at verse 19. David concludes by saying, every part of this plan, David told Solomon, was given to me in writing from the hand of the Lord. Here's where my mind kind of goes boing, 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 and explodes in little, little pieces all over the room. When was this given to David? 1,000 years before an elderly priest named Zechariah was chosen by Lot to walk in with incense. That's pretty miraculous. That's pretty amazing. 1,000 years before, God planned it all. God arranged it all. God brought it all together. Nothing random. Nothing by chance. Because God had a plan. And when I read that, it, it, it truly, it's overwhelming. It's really, it's overwhelming when we look at the care of God in his plans, in our lives as well. Some of you this morning, surely in a room this size, you have either had children or you yourself may have been born into a family where you were considered or told you were an accident, or that you were unwanted, or maybe even that you were a mistake. Not with God. No mistakes. Nobody unwanted. Nobody an accident. Yeah. God cares about the details of your life, all of the details. It's not random, it's not chance, it's not bad luck, it's not good luck. God is in the details. God is in the arrangements of our lives. It's not random, it's not random. There's one more. There's one more. Look at this one. Um, Anna is in the temple. 
Now remember that Simeon, we've already talked about this, Simeon, uh, this is the fulfillment, the old Simeon. He's talking with Mary and Joseph, and I love this as well. Here's a further reminder of this. Anna came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone. Now some of you who know your Bibles well will say, yes, but Pastor Anna was always in the temple. That's what the Bible says. So of course she saw him. No, that's not true. Because the temple area, for those of us that are from an American background, the whole temple area in general, part in the middle, women could not go to, go into, but in the area in general where women could go into, it was approximately, for those of us that are Americans, 35 acres. 35 acres. For those of us that think in hectares, hectares, it was about 15 plus hectares, 15 to 17 hectares. That's a pretty big area, isn't it? It's a huge area. Put Add into that all of the people walking this way and that way, going this way and that way, all of the crowds, all of the activities, all of the noise. And here we see Anna just happened to come along and she too had been looking and waiting and worshiping the Lord. And we see this beautiful picture. So we see, next slide, here's another Christmas confidence. God was and is sovereign in your life. No random chances. Nothing by accident. God orchestrates. God brings together. And then we close this morning with this. As we look at these Christmas confidences that we can have about the nature of God and the character of God. I want us to close with this passage and this final confidence this morning. We see the, the demonstration and the display of God's character and we see how he works with people, how he speaks to people, how he fulfills his word. And I want to leave you with this last confidence this morning because God didn't have to speak a word. He's God. He could have willed it into being, and all of this would have been. He could have spoken in one way, and everybody would have understood, but he didn't want to do it that way. He chose the way to demonstrate his love for us. And we end with Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. And I want you to look at the whole thing, because if we're honest, most of the time, we just do verse 6. It's that nice Christmas verse, isn't it, that we sing. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders. But I want you to go all the way through, don't stop at verse 6, go all the way through to the end of verse 7. And honestly, this is where I get really excited as well, because this passage ends with, this is the New Living Translation, other translations use the word zeal, or intense devotion. Other translations will use that as well. What does it say? The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. And here's this beautiful picture for you and me as we conclude this morning. Ah, the passionate commitment. Why was God and why is God passionately committed to fulfilling Everything, the beginning of what we see in the Christmas story, but all the way through to its completion when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords reigns on this earth and then forever we are together with Him. All of these parts that are really part of the Christmas story. It's just extrapolated. We should just take it out further. Why is this so? Because He's involved in what happened. His passionate commitment. Because in this story is the story of his great love, his son, his only son, whom he loved and in whom he was well pleased. And the other part of this story is you, and it's me. Men and women made in his image, though broken and marred by sin, Yet he has set his love upon us because he made us for himself and he made us for relationship. And so he says, I'm passionately committed to this. I will make it happen. His love is set upon you and set upon me. He's not a distant God, whatever you feel and whatever you think. He is not an uncaring God, whatever you feel or whatever you think. He is passionately committed.
He's passionately committed because of you, because of Jesus. For me, that's a Christmas confidence. He's committed to me. He's committed to you. He will work these things out. Is your life a mess? Pieces not fitting? Just bring all the pieces to him and say, Lord, here they are, and let him work out some of these things. Let him do his work. Let him speak to you. Let him renew and restore confidence in your heart as to what he has spoken about you and the plans that he has for your life. You're not chance or random accident. You're God's plan. You're his creation. He will see it through to the end. He's not going to give up on you when you have given up on yourself. This is our God, passionately committed. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning. And I'm just going to pray for you. And I want you to pray for yourself as we close this morning. Lord, we thank you for the confidence we receive as we look at all of these parts of that first Christmas story, the, the span of time, thousands of years, but you kept your hand on it. You spoke. You moved things. You worked. You led. You guided. But most of all, you have loved. And so, Lord, we come to you this morning. We come to you with who we are and what we are. May you speak confidence from you into our hearts and our lives this morning. God, for those this morning who have some broken, jagged pieces in their lives that aren't working out yet, that aren't fitting together very well, God, we bring them to you and just say, Lord, here it is. It's broken and I've helped to break it. Would you put it together? Would you put things back together in your way in your time because of your love for me. God, I can't trust in the circumstances. They are too bad. But I can trust in you because you are so good and you love me. Lord, I pray for the church this morning. May they know your love. May they have your confidence as a guard around their hearts. May they hold on to you as you bring things back together again in the right way, in your way, in their lives, however long it takes. And we say, thank you. We are grateful. We're grateful. And we give gratitude to you that you haven't given up, you haven't let go, you're not distant and you're not far away. You're here with us, Emmanuel, and you are passionately committed to us. We pray this in the name of the one who has come, Jesus, Jesus, amen, amen, amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters.